Um, good afternoon, and welcome to our uh, session, which um, has a bit of an Americanization to it, because it's not from folk to baroque. No, it's from folk to baroque. I want to make that quite clear. <laughs> I think we could all have a practice of that, from folk to baroque. <laughs> and that's because one of our one of our performers um, is uh, from Idaho. That's Natalie Brown, and Natalie is studying at the Elphinstone Institute, and she's doing a master's. An emblet in ethnology and folklore, and our other performer this afternoon is uh, studying between uh, the Elphinstone Institute and um, and the music department, which means he's mainly in the coffee bar actually. But anyway, <laughs> he's studying between the two places, and that's Ronnie Gibson. And Ronnie hails from somewhere near Edinburgh, uh, which will remain a mystery, it seems, Ronnie. Unless you want to say where from. Last word. Okay. <laughs> and Natalie will tell you the name of her hometown in Idaho. Go on, then. Cedar Rapids, Iowa. 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 I got the state of potato by the state. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyway, it's a, a great pleasure. Can we give them a really warm welcome?
Over the course of the next hour, we're going to be exploring some gems of 18th century Scottish fiddle music. In particular, we want to look at the connections between traditional music on the one hand and art music on the other, or <coughs> as you so correctly pronounced it, folk and baroque. <laughs> Given that at this time there was much less of a division between the two categories. 18th century Scotland is most immediately associated perhaps with Enlightenment figures such as David Hume or Adam Smith, whose innovations in the fields of philosophy and economics revolutionised thought and trade. Secondly, perhaps, we think of political events such as the Parliamentary Union of 1707 and the Jacobite uprisings of 1715 and 45, the consequences of which continue to be felt today. But the 18th century has also been called the golden age of Scottish fiddle music. Many of the most popular tunes today were composed at this time by fiddler composers such as Neil Gow and William Marshall. And the passion for dance ensured there was a constant demand for new dance tunes. Neil Gow was the composer of the first tune we played in our opening set. He was born in the Strathran region of Pushar in 1727 and spent his life in the village of Inver near Dunkeld, where he died in 1807. His lamentation for the death of his brother was written for his brother Donald, who died about 1786. Donald was a player of the cello, or bass fiddle, and we see him performing with Neil in his painting by David Allen of 1780. We don't really associate the cello with traditional music, but it was the case that every 18th century dance band would have at least one to keep the beat. We have some other pictures of Neil Gow, this penny wedding from 1795, and posthumous depictions such as this from 1816 and this from 1818, where we see Neil and Donald playing a penny wedding as imagined by David Wilkie. The second tune of our opening set, Jenny Jane the Weaver, is said to have been composed by the Reverend Alexander Garden after his handyman, an ex-weaver, refused to clean Garden's boots and got a beating for it from Jenny, the Reverend's wife. The next piece we're going to play is a violin sonata by the Italian composer Corelli. Uh, while we would make a distinction between Corelli on the one hand as a classical composer and Gao on the other as a folk musician, there is evidence to suggest that Gao, like most musicians in Scotland in the 18th century, was very fond of Corelli's compositions. In particular, we learn from Neil's son Nathaniel that his father was especially fond of the Gilles, from this scenario we're going to play. It's the second of the four movements. We're going to play it in two ways. Uh, first, we'll play it how we'd expect it to be played in a concert today. And second, we'll play it how we think Yoga might have done. <laughs>
big differences between the 18th century and now is the kit that was used to perform the music. We're playing on 18th century instruments by the Aberdeen maker, Joseph Rudman. Rudman famously repaired a fiddle of Neil Gow's after it had been damaged in a fall while crossing a frozen walk. And by these examples, he was a very fine craftsman. Um, they date from the middle years of his career, with one Madley's playing dating from 1776 and my one being 1778. So these are from the, the, the lifetime of Neil Gow uh, and classical figures like Mozart uh, and Haydn. They're part of the university's collection, and it's wonderful to get the opportunity to get them an aid in public. They're in 18th century configuration, which makes them quite different from modern instruments. The strings are made of gut rather than metal, which gives them a more earthy sound. And here's the modern metal. It's a much brighter sound. Um, and the, these 18th century configurations are played without the chin or shoulder rest. For your chin, for your shoulder. Um, and then the neck is also at a different angle. Um, given that less use was made of the higher positions. And see. This is much thinner, so I can get all the way. <coughs> I'll make that one. Um, uh, the developments that led to the modern instrument were geared at creating a bigger, brighter sound, which was better suited to the large concert hall that were built in the 19th century. A big factor in this was the raising of the pitch at which the strings were tuned. So play your uh, A string. Here's my A. We'll play them together. <laughs> and while the modern bow is designed to give long, smooth strokes, the, the earlier bows had a much more rhythmic feel to them. Much more rhythmic design. It's a bit shorter than that, but if I try and play the same figure, you'll find by the time I get to about here, the sound quality is just dead. Yeah. It just doesn't have the same. It's much better at uh, for, for dance music, really. <laughs>
there were other changes that had an impact on Scottish fiddle music as instrument construction and, and the publication of sheet music became less expensive, more and more people turned to the fiddle as a means of recreation. While playing for dancing continued to be important, the music also became important for its own sake. We also see in the 19th century a turn towards histories of Scottish fiddle music, whether as collections of the best tunes or books, such as Alexander Murdoch's The Fiddle in Scotland. In addition, the 19th century saw the rise of the music hall fiddler, with large groups of real players, as they were known, touring throughout Scotland and the UK to give performances of fiddle music to large audiences. The career of fiddler composer James Scott Skinner, the self styled Strats Bay King, makes a revealing comparison with that of Gow. Scott Skinner was born in Bankery in 1843 and received classical training in violin, studying in Manchester with Paris Conservatory trained Charles Rougier. As you can tell from this picture, he was anything but a retiring, modest introvert. <laughs> in addition to his generous nom de boom, he described his efforts at composition thus, talent does what it can, genius does what it must. <laughs> in further depictions of him, his confidence and ability shine through, whether in his high position work <clears throat> his commanding stance or his opulent attire. In addition to numerous tune collections, he published A Guide to Bowing, in which classical technique advised for the performance of fiddle music. We also have this interesting anecdote. Uh, in the Dundee Courier of, from the 15th of June, 1892. Yesterday, Mr. Scott Skinner, well known in the North as a musician and composer, paid a visit to the Aberdeen office of the Courier. At the time of his visit, communication was being carried on with the head office by telephone. And the happy glad occurred to one of the Aberdeen staff to suggest to Mr. Scott Skinner that he should play one of his compositions on his violin, which he happened to have with him to allow the members of the Courier staff at Dundee to listen by means of telephone to music being played over 60 miles away. The musician readily agreed and at once struck up the Bonnie Lies of Bon Accord, one of his most popular melodies. The experiment was very successful, the music being distinctly heard in Dundee and much enjoyed by the listeners both in Dundee and Aberdeen. When he died in 1927, Subscriptions were collected to erect an elaborate gravestone where he is buried in Allenvale Cemetery. We're now going to play, on modern instruments again, two of Scott Skinner's compositions. Scott Skinner's compliments to Dr. MacDonald is dedicated to Dr. Norman MacDonald of Skye, a collector and composer of fiddle tunes, and The Spay and Spate, which was composed in 1907 in imitation of the famous river.
that was uh, really something, wasn't it? Like, one thing I forgot to mention, but in fact this whole area, goodness me, there's 50 people in the other room. No, one thing I forgot to mention was that, uh, that this area of research is in fact what uh, Ronnie is doing his PhD on. So it's obviously, he's really into it, and especially into getting hold of a, a Ruddyman fill and, uh, and setting it to work, which I'm really impressed with. Uh, um, I saw just a week ago uh, uh, another example of a wonderful Ruddyman fiddle that was played by Nathaniel Gow. Uh, it was in the home of Paul Anderson, and, and that had similar had these dark, interesting colours and, and sort of different sort of resonances. Uh, extremely responsive, but nothing like the sort of explosive brightness of the modern violin. Uh, very much more interesting in its light and shade and colours. And I'll start off with a quick question. How did you decide what speed to play all your color forms? Was there a, did any of the writers, Oswald or any of the others, did they give you any clues as to what sort of tempies to choose? Sometimes they were, they were very helpful and would write things like slow. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, there's, there's a huge variety. You can adopt strategies. Because they're dance tunes, you can look at the, the dances that were intended to accompany if you had lots of steps to uh, fill in you and the fiddler went off you'd be falling all over the place so, so that gets that goes one measure but also I, I don't know about you but when we've been playing these different examples back to back each sort of, a certain character presented itself uh, which which seemed appropriate the way that you know, the, the notes on the page fall under the hands there's there's a relatively narrow um, margin, uh, tempo-wise, um, and the way that the instruments respond, uh, especially with these 18th century ones, uh, there's lots of different clues, but of course, you know, it's, it's a subjective thing, um, lots of tempos would mm -hmm. work. Um, do we have a question? Or two, or three? Yeah, I have a question. Okay. If I could ask him, if we ask the higher level of horn yeah, is that the same as the students? No, I think the high level part of my, is that not that? Yet, 
they probably sound nothing today like they did when they came out of his workshop. It, it's curious. Good question from the yes. um, I was wondering, you were describing the, the brightness of the sound that was um, due to the size of the concert hall. Um, in the 17th century, I, I wouldn't be able to imagine what size of the concert hall and what size of the crowd you may be playing to. So, uh, folk, uh, the, the weddings you were describing must be a much smaller audience. Um, have you got any idea of the size of the venues and the number of the crowds that they might be played to, especially back then? I think it was more the, but it was for dance, so it was more the, the rhythmic style, and the concert hall was more for the virtual, so I'm not sure if the yeah, size um, of the venue. It's a different performing concert. Yeah. I mean, it's the case, I mean, concert going was a, an 18th century invention, uh, this commercial uh, aspect where, you know, people could buy a ticket and come along and hear a concert, and, you know, the, the business, business acumen of musicians and how there's a buck to be made here. Um, but but in, in, in different contexts there'd be the barns, the barns, the sort of barn dance, penny wedding style, um, where maybe the, there was only a couple of fiddlers. And then there's there's you know rooms, well this is a nineteenth century building, but you know, chamber, chamber music. You see the, the Georgian houses in Edinburgh, um, quite relatively small rooms to hold a dance, but what they do is they put a table in the corner and, and sit the, the fiddler up on, on, on the table where his music can project over the noise of the of the dancing and the and the you know the beat and, and, and talking. Have you played in St. Cecilia's Hall in Edinburgh? No, I've not, but this is yeah. a perfect example. Of that. Yeah, that would be, I would guess, about the sort of size of the maximum size of Paul at the time. Okay, do we have another question? Yes. You know how hard you got all those down the door. <laughs> yeah, there's this uh, music publisher, late 18th century, called George Thompson, based in Edinburgh. And he was friends with Burns, um, um, or, well, not Burns but James Johnson, another um, publisher. And he was had this project where he wanted to improve the Scottish folk song to make them suitable for a, a better class of audience. Uh, and he, he approached various uh, composers, Haydn most famous like Beethoven and also uh, Thiel, um, sent these tunes uh, without the words, uh, sent them just a melody line, said, harmonize this, send it back to me, I'll see you all right. Uh, and the results like this, I mean, to, to be honest, the quality of this one and the producing that later, yeah, <laughs> they seem highly incongruous to us today. There, there are much better ones, uh, more successful ones. Um, but yeah, it's a curious blending uh, of, of what we see as, as folk uh, and classical. Um, and then these have been performed by the ladies and gentlemen uh, in the grand houses. I think mostly in Scotland, they send it to the Scottish market. Um, and for Hyde and Vero, they were just another commission uh, to the likes of Scottish musicology. So, well, perhaps the Scottish music has influenced the, the greatest compositions. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they, were, they were quite confused, uh, by all accounts, by the, the strange Scottish harmonies that don't, don't conform to uh, the classical uh, structures. Can you play something more? Yes. a great time. Let's tell us what it is. Soldier of Joy. Feel the the tailor. Thank you. 
very much indeed for being with us. We've had a, a wonderful hour, and uh, it's been absolutely excellent. And our awful lot of hard work and thinking and rehearsal has gone into it. Just one more round of applause. Yeah.